You see, Manolo just, uh, Manolo Hernandez, he just uh, connected. That's my friend from the Canaries. Oh, okay. Welcome. Let me just uh, start broadcasting um, on, face on Facebook. How you doing, Brian? I got in, Braulio. Thank you. Thank you. I see one of my students, Sebastian Garcia. Hello, Professor. How are you doing? And I'm there's doing... my good friend Manolo. Hi, Manolo. Un abrazo, Manolo. <laughs> ¿Cómo estás, Manolo? Bien, bien, bien. Ah, qué bien. Yo leí uno de sus artículos de sobre la, los canarios, muy interesante, y lo usé, lo usé para una presentación. Mm, gracias. Sí, sí. De los tinerfeños, ¿no? Do, del, de, la, de la migración de, de Tenerife. Tenerife puede ser, sí. Sí, sí. Mm -hmm. Oh, we have another person, so we'll just... Um... Maybe wait about 30, 30 seconds. And I, I think we're live on Facebook. So I think um, I think we're good to go. So okay. welcome everybody. My name's Brian and I'm here with my colleague Rich talking to Professor Luis Martinez Fernandez. Um, uh, Rich, Rich will be the moderator today. So, so thank you so much, Rich. Oh, thank you, thank you, Brian. Um, yeah, like, like uh, Brian said, we are here today with uh, Professor Luis Martinez Fernandez. Uh, welcome to uh, our broadcast here, Digital Cuba. This is also gonna be available on the Cuban Genealogy Podcast. And one of our objectives uh, is to provide more detailed histories on Cuba, where we can focus on a specific time period or a topic uh, to help build our knowledge on the island's history, which can help in turn provide us uh, important historical context for, for your family histories. Uh, again, these stories, and you're gonna hear a few of them today, can really help color and, and bring to life uh, the words on the documents that, that we're all so fond of collecting and trying to decipher that Spanish uh, script. Um, we have a special guest here with us today, Dr. Luis Martinez Fernandez. He's a professor of history at the University of Central Florida. Uh, welcome, and we are going to be discussing his book, uh, Key to the New World and Early Colonial History of Cuba, which won the bronze medal for general nonfiction at the Florida Book Awards, and first place for best history book in English at the International Latino Book Awards. It is a book that helps uh, fill in the gap in our knowledge on the island before 1700, there's really not a lot that's published, particularly in the period of the 1600s. Uh, and it examines Cuba's formative centuries in depth. And I think he brilliantly weaves together the island's geography, economy, society, culture, into this narrative that uh, begins, as we're gonna see with Cuba's indigenous population, and then goes into the island's early colonization by Spaniards. So welcome, Professor Martinez. Glad to have you with us today. Thank you very much for this invitation. Uh, Brian and Rich, uh, you're doing some wonderful work uh, as far as gathering materials that will be useful for generations to come. So I applaud your, your efforts and I'm glad to be here uh, to talk about one of my children. <laughs> um, books, are, <laughs> books are like children and, and this is the, the baby of the family. Um, it came out in 2018, so I look forward to an engaging conversation about that. Great. No longer you, baby. <laughs> no longer baby. Can you tell us just a little bit about your, your trajectory, kind of like how, how you started to, um, what made you want to learn, particularly about, about this period in history, kind of what led you to, to write this book? Sure. I, I became a historian because I had to. Actually, uh, when I was around 14 years old, I, I made the decision that I wanted to pursue a career in history. Um, so I've been uh, doing that ever since. 
Um, I some of the things that you know you become not a protagonist but an actor in so many historical processes. Of course, the Cuban Revolution, family exile, migration to Peru, then migration to Puerto Rico. Uh, when we, when you are part of these processes, uh, you spend a lot of time figuring out, you know, what all of this is about. And for me, history was the natural course. Now, I started working on the 19th century and wrote three books on the subject, uh, on the period. Uh, then I believe that in order to really understand Cuban history, I had to go to the roots. And I think I was I was right on that uh, because when you read about those first uh, couple of centuries in Cuban history, you find so much of yourself. That's when the Cuban culture really took shape. And you, we were talking a few minutes ago about Choteo, yeah. that brand of Cuban humor. Well, all of that uh, dates back to that period. And, um, and and I wrote a book on the Cuban Revolution. I would not advise any friend of mine to do that. Uh, <laughs> it is a, a very difficult terrain to navigate, but I was happy to do that. So, so in, in essence, I started with the 19th century and then I recognized that there were two uh, big gaps, which I call the book ends of Cuban history. That is that early period. And of course, the period of the Cuban revolution. Many people have written about it, of course, but uh, as far as a, a history book um, that is comprehensive, I, I, I wanted to do that and I, and I did. Right. I mean, that's, yeah. Uh... When I read your book, I, I was struck by the fact that I didn't know really much about the 1600s. And I thought in my head, there was always this kind of like, like 1600s in Cuba was kind of like this like void. It was this this area. And then I read your book, particularly the chapter, which which we'll get to, but on piracy and all the all the wars going on in the 1600s. So there was a lot going on, you know, um, but uh it's just, you know, there's just not not, not a lot out there, particularly in, in English. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about uh, some of some of the topics that that you you write about uh, geography, right? So you you say that geography and history are intertwined in Cuba, and and one of the things that we wanted to go over was uh, geography. A lot of us don't know, you know, where certain cities are, or um, we know we're from we're. Our, our ancestors are from Havana or for, they're from Santiago, but we don't really know the context of how these cities formed. Um, can you tell us a, a little bit about geography, its importance in Cuba, um, how things like the fact that Cuba is an island, its insularity, which I think you do a, re a really great job of dissecting, dissecting how that influences uh, its historical trajectory. Good. And in that chapter, uh, which I thought was fundamental in order in order to understand Cuba, well, this is where the history uh, develops and evolves. <clears throat> uh, I thought that the geography was very important. Um, there are many aspects of geography that make Cuba what it is. And I would place on top of that list uh, the insularity. Cuba is an island, and there are certain... Uh, historical events, for example, that uh, are explained by Cuba's insularity. Why? When the rest of Latin America was fighting for its independence and armies were crossing even the Andes, why did Cuba and Puerto Rico stay behind? Well, there you got it, insularity. Uh, insularity also has uh, a, a psychological effect on a people. If you look at island societies, Japan, for example, uh, uh, England. Uh, these are societies that develop a, a culture that almost believes that they are the center of the world. <laughs> and I, I think we could say that about uh, Cuba as well. Okay. That notion of, of, of a mental insularity, which actually... Uh, contrast very sharply uh, 
with another aspect also dictated by geography, which is Cuba, particularly Havana, became the, the key to the new world. And Havana is located at the inter and eastern, uh, western Cuba is located at the intersection of the Atlantic, the Caribbean, and the Gulf of Mexico. All of that shaped Cuba, which turned it also into a very cosmopolitan society, even uh, during the early periods. I mean, the fleets had to stop there on their way back to, to Europe. And with the fleets came the good things and the bad things. Um, so yes, uh, the location is also very important. The fact that Cuba is mostly a flat island and how that played a role in the development of sugar production. Uh, so yes, that, that chapter looks at all these factors and certainly uh, a very important one is the proximity to the United States. Um, I, I've written on this subject and Cuba and the United States are, uh, it's, it's like a married couple that divorce, <laughs> but then they're forced to live under the same roof. And that's essentially uh, that kind of special relation between these two countries. That's so great. yes, that's the first chapter, geography. And, and wh why is it? Because Santiago, so I get, you know, we'll get into the, the, early colonization efforts in a bit, but but why is it that Havana, so Santiago is the capital first, then Havana becomes the capital. Is it because Havana is closer to the North American continent? It's kind of like an easier gateway to, you know, an easier gateway between say Europe and the Americas than Santiago was? Well, yes, it, it has to do primarily with several geographical factors. One is the, the prevailing winds, the currents, uh, the Gulf current uh, that passes uh, right next to Havana and goes all the way to, to Europe. Those are very important. The first capital was actually Baracoa. Oh, yeah. um, and, and that was very brief. And then Santiago, because um, remember that at the beginning, Hispaniola, was the main center of colonization. So Eastern Cuba was closer to Hispaniola. Now, uh, gradually, because of the shipping, uh, because of uh, an, another industry that developed early in Cuba was shipbuilding, um, commerce, then the energy, the economic energy shifted towards Havana, and then decades later, it became the official capital. And shipbuilding is is um, you you mentioned I think in the later chapter and that was just eye opening the legacies of that how that influenced um, architecture how it influenced um, cultural religious icons like Santa Barbara mm -hmm. um, Virgen de Regla so I think that that's a very good point to make early on because shipbuilding is going to kind of influence a lot of a lot of um, Cuban culture. And, and, and it brought wealth and it brought um, very uh, people with, who were good with the crafts. Now that you mentioned that, um, this book was a challenge in the good sense of the word, because first of all, as you know, there is no comprehensive history of these uh, early centuries published since 1920. I, I can it's hard for me to even say it, but it's the truth. Yeah. So, and I wanted to do so many things in a book. Uh, first of all, talk about the island as a whole, sort of the macro level in its relations with the outside world. Um, but also I look at these uh, ecosystems, Havana is one of them, the sugar plantation is another, the frontier is a third. And then the other thing that I like to do is to humanize this history. Yes. So when you read the pages of these book, uh, you will get some winks when I introduce uh, some very fascinating characters uh, that allow me not just to tell the story about the attacks, but you know the this was a particular pirate and and, and tell a story. Uh, when I talk about slavery. I uh, and, and actually race relations, I, I bring up uh, a fascinating character, um, Paula de Guiluz, uh, 
who was a former slave and ends up being not one of the richest women in Cuba, but she marries the richest man on the island, and she ends up having all of this luxury around her, and she was um, she was envied by the white elite. Then she ends up in in the in, because of brujeria and other activities. Uh, the Inquisition knocks on her door, and she ends up in Cartagena. So I wanted to tell all of these human stories because that's the history that I believe in. Uh, I also believe in cultural history. For example, I just don't mention that well, ships were built, okay, and many ships and, and large and so on, but what is the cultural legacy of those kinds of activities? Right, and I think you do a great job of bringing, it, bringing history literally to life. Um, some of the stories are just fascinating in, 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 in your, uh, in your chapters that, that um, focus on them. Um, I wanna talk for a, a, a second about the indigenous population um, because the indigenous population in Cuba essentially dies out like pretty much, like almost complete, almost um, completely dies out. Um, and I, there's a lot of, I know, controversy, debate, over the indigenous population, how many there were, how exactly they, they died out. Um, can you tell us, is there a way for us to know how many indigenous people there were on the island of Cuba before 1492? Yeah, those calculations are, are tough to make and they're always political. Uh, history is not neutral, history is always political. So there was a, a big debate going back to the 1960s about how many uh, indigenous people lived in, in the new world. And some came up with a calculation, 100 million, others uh, far lower than that. Uh, there was, of course, some exaggeration. Fray Bartolomé de las Casas mm -hmm. uh, always saw things uh, with with his Andalusian eyes. I hope I'm not offending anybody. I love Andalusia, but he was prone to exaggeration. Now the calculations are about a hundred thousand to and the highest are about four hundred thousand. I think it's perhaps a hundred fifty thousand. Um and uh you're right. Well the population was decimated. But uh, it's fascinating to see how with DNA and uh, 23 and me and what's the other one ancestry um, we we have learned about the racial composition of the Cuban people and as far as that goes it's very it's it's very heavy I forget the exact numbers uh, pro proportions you can find that in the book, but particularly in the region of Oriente. Now, there's a fascinating character, uh, Vasco Porcayo, and he was an, one of the early colonizers. He was a, an Hidalgo, a member of the lower uh, nobility, and, you know, uh, he had uh, about 200 children, and these were mostly mestizos, some mulatos. And I venture to say, and maybe someday with advances in, in genealogy, we're going to figure out that all Cubans, exaggerating, of course, that many Cubans are descendants of Barco de, Vasco de Porcayo, 200 children at a time when the population was very small. Uh, he was not a very nice guy, uh, by the way. <laughs> What, what years would that have been? Fifteen hundreds that he's around. Yes. That he's around? Yes. Right. And and what what happens to this uh, population? What happens to the Dainos? Well, yes. Um, <clears throat> students of this subject uh, have calculated that uh, the the biggest uh, factor in the decimation of that population were diseases. Um, that were not known to them, therefore they didn't have immunities. Uh, of course, there was a factor of those who were abused in, in the uh, conquest and killed. Um, but there was another factor such as suicide, which was very prevalent. And uh, 
you know, interestingly enough, I was making these connections. Cuba, unfortunately, historically, is one of those societies with a very high rate of suicide. Yeah. Uh, we've seen that uh, it's certainly the 20th century when you look at the statistics. Um, and then there were, you know, some of the native women uh, decided to abort their, their children rather than bring them to the conditions that were being created by the Spaniards. Those are the main, the main factors. Yeah, it was also a, a form of slave resistance for enslaved African suicide. Yes. Uh, you know, it, yes, it was, it, you know, some people may not be happy with me saying this, but suicide can be a form of resistance. Mm -hmm. And it was very prevalent among uh, African slaves, uh, partially because of their religious beliefs and the belief that, and, and that's why so many of the slaves committed suicide by drowning. And the belief was that if you, uh, that these bodies of water, oceans, uh, would connect you with Africa. Uh, so that's another strain that explains why Cuba has such a high rate of suicide historically. Yeah, very interesting. Um, Columbus, Christopher Columbus. <laughs> I think you do a great job of kind of bringing him to life, kind of trying to demythify uh, Columbus, who's a, you know undoubtedly a, a complex figure. Um, thought he was going to reach Asia, right? He still thinks Cuba is uh, is 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 Asia, and there's actually a great um, you have a great illustration in your book that depicts. Uh, it's a map that kind of depicts the way that Columbus viewed uh, the Americas. Um, who who was Columbus? What what was he what was he trying to do here? What did he you know? What what what, what mistakes did he make? Yeah, well, he was a very complex character, as you say, and it was a challenge for me because you know I didn't want to write a chapter which is not on Columbus, it's on the, what used to be called the discovery. Uh, I prefer to use the term first encounters. So mm -hmm. how do I write a chapter that is not just repeating the story and the facts of the three vessels and the dates of, of, of encounters and all of that? I, I, I certainly didn't wanna do that because I wanted to make the book stimulating. So one of the things that I do is <clears throat> I, I present 1492, circa 1492, is a time of, of dramatic global change, uh, certainly in Europe. And I present Christopher Columbus as a medieval mind. And that's why he engaged in these calculations. And, and he, uh, for example, one of the reasons why uh, he did not want to acknowledge that this was a new world early on, and actually he died believing that, was because he was deeply religious and he believed that the Trinity uh, was represented in God's creation. So you have three continents, three oceans, three races, and then all of a sudden uh, he comes across uh, what later became evident was a new continent and uh, it would seem to be a different race and he's struggling with all of that, uh, finding explanations, mostly religious explanations. I pit him against Amerigo yes. Vespucci. Yeah. Um, and, and what I try to do is to, you, you know, we, we open a map of the world and we know what it looks like. There are no surprises. We know where Europe is. We know the Atlantic, where it's located. But what I try to do is take the reader by the hand demonstrating what the world looked like for them. And this was not something that was in a map. Uh, this is something that they had to invent. Uh, one of the authors that I use in this chapter is a Mexican philosopher, Edmundo Ogorman. And he talks about the invention of America, that it was actually an intellectual act and the person. So you, you have these parallel travels uh, uh, Columbus's expeditions and Vespucci. And after each trip, they're, they're trying to, because the world continues to expand and they're trying to make sense of this. Uh, 
And uh, the one who ends up inventing America is a man of the Renaissance, Vespucci. Yes. It's interesting that Columbus, you know, uh, <laughs> I use the, the analogy of, you know, a, a, a modern amateur scholar, uh, universities won't let him in. <laughs> he doesn't have the degrees, he doesn't have the knowledge or yeah. the prestige. Um, but he ended up, you know, these two men together uh, made this possible. On the one hand, the science, and on the other hand, that passion of, of Christopher Columbus, and the two combined uh, invented America. And Amerigo Vespucci, in some ways, has the last laugh because the whole continent is named after him. That is right. <laughs> uh, Columbus, Colombia, <laughs> but Amerigo Vespucci got the name, yes. Um, you, you talk about the notion of manufacturing Cuba. What, what, what do you mean by that? How, how does, uh, where Spain is in 1492, how does that influence mm -hmm. the way it goes about colonizing Cuba? Yes, well, uh, when I use the phrase, uh, man, the manufacture of Cuba, I am borrowing a phrase from uh, what I consider one of the best authors ever to come out of the Caribbean. Uh, he won a Nobel Prize for Literature, V.S. Naples. And uh, he uses that phrase. Now, he uses it in a way that I don't agree because <clears throat> uh, he says that nothing was created in the Caribbean, that everything was the result of empire. Of course, I don't believe that. I don't think he believed that fully as well. And, um, but I, I borrow that phrase to, to show that uh, it was the Europeans because they came to dominate the other groups, the indigenous population, the African slaves, that they wanted to create, to manufacture something from scratch. We know that there was something before, and we know that that uh, played an important role in the development of Cuba. Um, 1492 is a, circa 1492 is a time of, uh, of transition again, particularly in Europe. So there, there's, of course, the conquest in which the Spaniards uh, uh, militarily defeat the indigenous population that happens very early on. But then there were other fights. <clears throat> there were other fights among different sectors of society. The church, on the one hand, the lower nobility, um, the crown, which was an investor in these, uh, in these processes. Um, still the Spanish crown has many investments, Iberia being one of them. Well, well this dates back to uh, Ferdinand and Isabella who invested in these ventures. And there were two models, <clears throat> two models that were sort of clashing. Uh, one model is the Portuguese model. The Portuguese model was, well, okay, we found Cuba. And by the way, Christopher Columbus was a believer in this in this model. Uh, that's why when he writes in his diary, he's so obsessed about the ports and the rivers that, that, that come to, the, to these ports. And in essence, it's called the, the factoria model that comes from a Portuguese word. And the factoria was a model of colonization which did not see a need for a massive, um, uh, a massive relocation of, of people, they believe that, well, as long as we have port cities that we control, then the indigenous population uh, will bring products and we can trade there. We don't need to colonize fully. Uh, by the way, that was the model that the Portuguese used in, in Western Africa. The other model was based on La Reconquista. La Reconquista, many of you know, it's a 700 year process whereby uh, Christian Spain begins to reconquer uh, territories away from Muslim domination. And uh, what that did was that it created a culture of, of war. Uh, 
um, a culture of continuous expansion, although those of you who know Spanish history will bring me to, to Capitulo because it, it, wasn't, it wasn't all the time. You know, there were these movements south and then there was consolidation and then centuries later. But in any event, what that did was it created a culture whereby those who fought were expecting rewards from the crown. And the rewards, and actually the institution that came out of that was the encomienda. And the encomienda gave, conquist, gave those warriors control over areas and the right to tax that population. Uh, well, whereas Columbus would have liked the factoria model, what ended up ended up dominating was the encomienda and expansion model, uh, which meant that, yes, we need large numbers of people to colonize, and we also need to dominate the indigenous population, and we need to tax them. Actually, they tax them to death, and, you know, encomiendas <clears throat> were really death camps. Yeah, I, I didn't realize that it came from Spain. I thought it was an institution that was kind of invented in, in the new world, but. I thought so too, before I wrote this book. So that's yeah. why I call, I use the word that the, the conquest was the sequel of the Reconquista that's because Atlantic. so many, yeah. Of, yeah, so many of the practices uh, yeah. that were developed. And, and by the way, the attitudes as well um, were transplanted to the new world. You, you provide some really great numbers on the decline of the indigenous population, not great, but sad numbers, um, where uh, you, and, and these are estimates, but a, a population of over 100,000 indigenous inhabitants shrinks to 22,000 by 1519 and to 5,000 um, in 1555. Um, as the population declines, a lot of them are, a lot of the indigenous people are placed in, in what are called reducciones, which are kind of akin to reservation villages. In yes. Guanabacoa, um, which is uh, kind of on the outskirts of Havana, was one of those reducciones, as was Yara, Mayari, Yateras, La, La Guira, and El Caney. Um, can you tell us a little bit I did not know much about reducciones. I knew that there was an indigenous presence in, in Guanabacoa and it kind of, mm -hmm. that's kind of how it, the, the La Vila de Guanabacoa comes about. But can you, can you tell us a little bit about what these reducciones were, what, we, what their purpose was? Yes, uh, well, most of you know about Fray Bartolomé de las Casas. He was a crusader for the protection of the natives. Um, Queen Isabel, uh, Reina Isabel, was also very heavily influenced by that. And so there were, there were clashes in, in Europe and discussions, philosophical discussions about what to do with the natives. Um, and then the encomiendas were actually efforts to protect the indigenous people from extermination, full extermination. And uh, the other piece to this puzzle has to do with the fact that, that you know, the indigenous population did not die off biologically because those survivors who were actually the majority of the population early on, they were absorbed into Spanish society. And yes, uh, biologically speaking, whatever that means, they were, uh, they had indigenous ancestors or, or were, indigenous themselves, but culturally they begin to embrace because they saw it as expedient. It was a, a form of, of social mobility. Interestingly, also the conquistadors and the colonizers saw marriage with indigenous women of the cacique elite as advantageous. So we have, and in this book, I talk about several characters who were mestizos, yet they had a lot of uh, political and economic power, uh, largely because of, of the side of the mother, the indigenous uh, women of the cacique elite. 
and, and marriages were very strategic uh, in that during that time. I think not just with the white men and the indigenous women, I think they were strategic as a way of sort of uh, consolidating power. I think Havana early on is very, um, uh, kind of forms its elite by, you know, through these, these marriages. Yes, it's true. I mean, you see certain last names like Rojas, Velasquez, Boroto, there's much intermarriage uh, between those clans and that's how they consolidate uh, that elite. Uh, some of these names actually continue to be powerful names. Uh, I forgot to mention Nunez, I forgot to mention uh, Recio. the Recio, Recio family yeah. from, from Camagüey. Uh, many of these families uh, continue to hold economic and political power for for centuries in some cases. Yeah. Um, the Catholic Church, uh, you, you talk about it as a hierarchical institution. How does the Catholic Church start in Cuba? I mean, I, you know, I think a lot of us have this, this idea that the church um, ends up becoming kind of a weak institution in Cuba, at least by the by the 20th century, is kind of like my 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 notion. Mm -hmm. Um, but how, how does this start in Cuba? And we, we know that you, you tell us at Santiago, it becomes the first diocese in 1522. Um, yes. But by 1609, three of the six convents on the island are, are already in Havana. So does this mean yes. that by 1609, Havana has already surpassed uh, Santiago in, in, in importance? Uh, as far as a religious presence, yes. Um, uh, the church hierarchy, though, did not move to Havana, but the clergy did. There were much larger numbers of them there. Uh, it's an interesting church. Uh, if you, I mean, one of the most, uh, I don't want to say enjoyable, but fun parts of, of writing this book was to see the, the deep corruption that enveloped Cuba in every aspect. And we're talking about the elites, uh, we're talking about the church hierarchy. We're talking about, you know, I, I believe in, in one of the main topics of this book is uh, sugar and slavery. That's why I selected the a sugar cane plant yeah. as, uh, as the cover for this book. Uh, slavery had a, an effect a pernicious effect uh, on almost every aspect of society. Yeah. And a lot of it had to do with smuggling of slaves, which was an early practice. They, they didn't want to pay taxes. Uh, the church got involved. Um, <laughs> a book in the 19th century, uh, Cuba is called La, La, La Isla del Chocolate. <laughs> and the roots of that chocolate with warts and all. Are, are to be found in these early centuries. Wow, yeah, I, that, that was a great, um, I thought a great argument you made towards the end of the book uh, when you talk about slavery and how it, it corrupts everyone, it poisons yes. everybody. So it, yes, you know, it does. It, um, it's a, a very uh, pernicious influence. What, one thing I, I, I found interesting and I could relate to, to some of the topics that we've discussed on uh, on some of our, our Facebook pages um, was that the religious orders like the Jesuits, the Dominicans, the Franciscans were uh, the ones that, that started to establish hospitals in Cuba. So they were like some of the first people to establish the first hospitals in Cuba. And I know from my research in Matanzas, one of my ancestors is actually a whole Facebook page just on this family, the Tapanes <laughs> family. This, this man from Genoa, I don't know how he ends up, we still don't know how he ends up in Madanzas, but he does from Genoa, Carlo Tapani, uh, which becomes Tapanes, ends up starting the first or, or funding the first hospital, which is called San Juan de Dios. Um, it, the first hospital in Matanzas in like the 1740s. Um, do, you, do you know any more about this connection between the religious orders and, and, and hospitals and uh, orphanages is it was it just something that they instinctively did well uh, the state wasn't 
and, and, and engage in, in building those kinds of institutions. So going back to Spain, and these are sometimes it's the cofradías, which are religious uh, groups of lay people, um, collected the, the funds, built these hospitals. And uh, yes, the not just hospitals, but um, places for orphanages, for example. Mm -hmm. or um, to house young women who were unmarried uh, to protect them. Um, so it was the church that played the, these roles in, in Cuba. And how does the Inquisition, and again, I'm just thinking of that, the, that story, wonderful story, but kind of heartbreaking story about, um, I guess her name, you said it was Paula. Um, but how does the Inquisition play out in Cuba? I think the Inquisition, a lot of us associate it with Spain, you know, rightfully so with Iberia, with Spain, but not, we don't think of it too much in Cuba. Um, how does that play out in Cuba? It, you know, yeah. was, it, was there a lot of yeah. repression or? It does, somebody actually, I think from FIU, you may know him. Leo. Leo? Yes. Yeah. He's a friend of mine, Has yeah. Been, yeah, he, he wrote his dissertation on that subject. Uh, it must be fascinating. I need to read it. Um, the, the Inquisition in Cuba did not have a strong presence because the strong uh, and, and the, the strong presence was in Mexico and also in Cartagena. Now, that doesn't mean that they didn't have agents in Havana and what got this woman in trouble was not so much the brujeria that she was engaged in, but as I said earlier, she had a glamorous uh, wardrobe uh, worthy of a Spanish noble. Um, it, it, I, I forget where in the book, but uh, I, I, I list all of these um, pieces of clothing very luxurious. And of course, we know that she owned them because when the Inquisition uh, got to her and, and there was a lot of envy. So, you know, what is this former slave woman doing? Not married because she wasn't married, but being the concubine of the man who administers the, 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 the copper mines. How in the world and who does she think she is dressing that way? And we know all all these uh, items of clothing because the belt, uh, the, I like the belt. What was it? The buckle, the San Agustin belt. She had like the latest, you know. Yes, <laughs> that's a story in and of itself. Where did you find uh, that? Where, where do you like, what? How did you find those uh, those stories? Well, uh, the Cinto de San Agustin was in that inventory because the Inquisition took hold of her wardrobe, her jewels, everything. And I wonder what is a Cinto de San Agustin? And I did some research and it, it, it was something very valuable. And she was engaged in, um, in, in brujeria and maybe she found this very valuable because uh, apparently having a Cinto de San Agustin gives you a, a free, uh, uh, get out of hell pass, <laughs> not just one, but two, two times. I don't know the theology behind that, but she owned one of those. And that was something very, very valuable. The good thing to uh, have for sure. <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing is that the great irony is that she ends up uh, just with one piece of clothing. It's a sack, uh, which was a penitential garb that the Inquisition forced her to wear. So you go from, you know, top of the line fashion to penitential garb within a matter of a few years. Uh, so before we get to sugar, which I think is like the proverbial elephant in the room when we are talking about Cuban history, and I think kind of sucks up a lot of yeah. uh, the historiography, uh, not necessarily wrongly so, but I want to talk about something that perhaps a lot of, a lot of us are not aware of, were these other industries, and, and I think, I, I think I, you do a really great job of, again, of providing some nuance to 
the way sugar takes root in Cuba, it doesn't, it's not immediately this huge revolution. It doesn't immediately become the monocrop that we're gonna see it become later on in the 19th century. Um, hides, cow hides were very, mm -hmm. were like one of the main exports. And I don't think a lot of us are aware of that. I think also in some of the other Caribbean islands, it was big. So Cuba was really big on, on cattle ranching. Right, particularly in the 1600s. Can, do you, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, that's true. And you're right. Sugar has dominated Cuban historiography. And I am in part guilty of, of proposing that. But there were other products. And um, what's interesting is that these were the strategy was <clears throat> to leave cattle, horses, cows, pigs, goats run free. They multiplied. And then you have hunters uh, who capture these animals and kill them uh, for the sake of the hides. Remember, the, the hides had many, many uses. Uh, they were used in machines for belts. Uh, they were used for shoes. They were used for hats. They were used um, to hold parts of vessels together. Uh, it was one of the exports not only to Europe, but remember that Cuba plays a key role in the conquest of the mainland. And Hernán Cortés, for example, uh, who That's how is, he jumps out of, of Cuba. He actually double crosses the governor, Velázquez, and he goes on to become the world's richest person. <clears throat> Can you tell us a little bit about these early uh, Spanish colonizers that arrive in Cuba? Obviously, a lot of them are going to leave, like you said, when they realize there's not much gold in Cuba. They realize they can get rich in places like Mexico or, or Peru, um, or like Hernando de Soto goes and starts to explore Florida. Um, yeah. But where where do these early Spanish uh, colonizers come from? I know a lot of us have, a lot of Cubans have a lot of Canarian heritage, a lot of Galician heritage. So Galicia is not really, you don't have a lot of Gallegos early on. Um, no. Where where do do these early Spanish colonizers come from and, and what, what is motivating them to, to come yes. to somewhere like Cuba? Uh, many of them are from Andalusia uh, and second place Extremadura. I'm talking about the first decades. And remember, if you, you know, I love to travel. I've been to Seville. Uh, Seville was not just a, a, an important port, but it was for a while the only port that could be used for trade with the New World. So Andaluces were there. And when these uh, <clears throat> colonizing efforts were made, uh, they, they, they were dominant in that regard. And um, later on, the Canarios, uh, we have uh, in this room uh, Professor Manuel Hernandez, who's the world's foremost expert on Canarios in the Americas. So I better be, uh, keep my my facts straight. Um, the Canary the Canary Islands are fascinating because they were not part of of the peninsula. Of course, they are actually part of Africa. And uh, we don't think of them that way. Um, but the English were very interested in the Canary Islands for various reasons having to do with trade for the most part. And now the, the Spanish crowns, the Spanish crown could not really uh, dominate. Well, let me take that back. Um, the Spanish crown decided to give certain benefits historical benefits as far as free trade, for example, to uh, the Canary Islands. Uh, it, it decided to be tolerant, religiously speaking, uh, allowing Protestant uh, churches. And for a while, there were provisions that, yes, well, you know, if you want to come to the New World, you have to pass through Seville, but the Canary Islands were given special privileges. That's why there were so many vessels um, going to places like Cuba, um, what today is the Dominican Republic and, and Puerto Rico because of those special 
uh, concessions. And that's why so many of those who came to Cuba um, late 1500s, but mostly the 1600s were from the Canary Islands. And that's why we share so many cultural similarities. Yeah. And sitting down to talk with a, somebody from the Canary Islands is like sitting down and talking to a friend from Puerto Rico or Cuba. Yeah. Yeah, I think we definitely Cuban Spanish definitely derives a lot from from Canary and uh, Canary the way that the Canarians speak Spanish. And also one thing I didn't mention, but I think is fascinating are the indigenous words that persist to this day. So huracan, right? Hurricane mm -hmm. is an is a Taino word. Yes. Um, hamaca, the hammock, right? Canoe. Um, yeah. Guayaba. So what, you know, even though the the culture itself doesn't survive uh, intact, we inherit. Um, yes. I think you mentioned if you eat guava paste or if you um, if you eat guayaba and some, some other things, you know, we're- Sleep on a hammock. <laughs> sleep on a hammock. Those are um, legacies of the, of the uh, indigenous culture. Um, we, I'm glad that you mentioned the gender imbalance. Um, what part did women play in, in this early colonization? I think you do a great job of talking about Isabel de Bobadilla, which I think a lot of people are not aware that Cuba early on in the 1500s had this uh, woman who steps up and kind of becomes interim governor in her husband. That's right. Yes, yeah, she was the wife of uh, de Soto, if I recall correctly. And there were many other powerful women, um, mostly white, because there were so few of them and the marriage market was <laughs> well let me not go there but the marriage market was in favor of of, of white women and so you find uh many uh women who marry many many times uh you have many stories of affairs you have stories of uh actually uh, because there were so few white women the white Spaniards and their descendants tended to marry with indigenous people, indigenous women. I, I came across a, a story of somebody uh, who was saying, well, you know, uh, if you're an indigenous man, uh, there's no way you're going to get married because the whites were not always getting married, but many times co cohabitating with the indigenous people. But yes, women, white women of the elite were very, very powerful. Uh, the key was not, uh, the key was, well, it, you couldn't own property. <clears throat> if you were married, uh, you couldn't own property. Um, the key was <laughs> uh, to be a widow. And there's some stories about very suspicious actions um, poisonings and things like that, because if you were a widow, then you could own property. But as long as you were married, it belonged to your husband. Yeah, I think be, being a widow is the way, definitely the way to go. <laughs> and I think that is also, um, that holds true, not just for, for Cuba, I think for, for a lot of places that during that time, mm -hmm. certainly the Caribbean and par parts of Africa, uh, widowed women were, were, were very powerful and had a lot of um, liberties that married women did not. Um, the slave trade, the African slave trade, um, as we know, the indigenous population dies out. Bartolomé de las Casas, who is, is a, a priest who writes um, uh, Destruction of, of the Indies, which is really kind of uh, our, our, one of our only records of what happens during this time. He definitely exaggerates. He has some, some, some definite political objectives with his book. Um, but thanks to the book, you know, we're able to, to learn um, a, a lot about what happens and, and the abuses. And in some ways he kind of becomes this, the world's first international human rights spokesperson uh, in, 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 in some ways. But he, yeah, as as far as the indigenous people, as far as yes, yes. and that's the segue, <laughs> is that one of the things that he suggests is to that you know perhaps indigenous people are not cut out for for this hard labor, and that perhaps mm -hmm. Africans would be, um, and that the crown should perhaps. Can you tell us how the slave trade 
takes root in Cuba and how it develops. I think you do a great job of, of breaking down the different stages of, of the slave trade as it develops and kind of, kind of leading us up to sugar, you know, because that um, sugar and slavery, like, like you say, really go, go hand in hand. Um, so can, can you talk a little bit about the, the slave trade? Sure. Uh, early on, the Spaniards uh, develop uh, the idea that they will not do the work themselves, <laughs> which is not it true for everybody, culture. you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah but, but that, it, I think it was part of it because it would that didn't hold true so much for the for the British and the French and the Dutch, you know, who yes, sent out a and, lot of indentured servants, um, but the Spanish were not didn't want to work. Or, or do well, stuff with their hands, I should say. Yes, yes, that, that's a great point. Uh, to this day, I mean, I'm not saying that people in Spain or people of Spanish no, descent no, no, don't no. work with their hands. We know that they do, yeah. but there is a an aversion to manual labor. That is, if you can avoid it, you avoid it. Yeah. Uh, I teach my history of Cuba and the Caribbean. Uh, and sometimes I tell people, well, you know, in the United States, we don't have that. Uh, you go to Home Depot, I'm told, <laughs> you go to Home Depot any Saturday and you will see doctors and executives buying stuff, uh, tools to, 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 do the, to do it themselves. But in the Spanish tradition, that's, that's not as strong. I remember uh, having a conversation with a professor who said, for goodness sakes, uh, professors in the United States mow their own lawns, <laughs> which speaks to that. So there was that issue, uh, an aversion to manual labor, which was also sort of connected with impure religious origins. The Jewish uh, population, the Muslims, they worked with their hands. They were the, the, the artisans. And, uh, and then on the other hand, realizing that the indigenous population is not built. I mean, that's that's how they put it, that physically the indigenous population could not do it. So they rationalize um, slavery. And one of the fascinating things about the Caribbean is that it is in the Caribbean, in places like Cuba, where we find the roots of a modern form of colonialism and of a modern form of slavery. We know that slavery has been with us for centuries, but what happened in the Caribbean was this strong association between race and slavery and also notions of slaves not being uh, human in some cases uh, or not being deserving of uh, being treated like human beings. So yes, it becomes an important part of, of the story of Cuba, the slave labor. I think that's a great connection to make that the whole notion of slavery having this racial, um, or rather of, of racial hierarchies, um, I think really um, takes off during, during this time period. I think first with the indigenous people who are seen as inferior and then um, to, to uh, African slaves, uh, African slavery. Um, how, uh, the, the, the institution of slavery, however, is very different in, in Spanish America than it is in, 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 in say, English America or, or French or uh, in, in Saint-Domingue or the, or the French islands. How, what is that difference? Like how, um, and, and again, you talk about that, how, how enslaved Africans are kind of able to use the legal system um, to, to uh, kind of negotiate their role in society. How, how is it different? Uh, and there was a great vignette, you, you talk about the one poor girl, oh my God, Maria, I don't remember the exact thing, but her owner, Catalina Hernandez, she's trying to buy her, her freedom. Um, and, and, and slaves could do that. It was a process of cuartación, they had to go to court, but that was something that was unique to to the uh, Iberian form of, of uh, our Iberian institution of slavery as opposed to, to the others. She tries to buy her freedom and then she doesn't come up with the money. And can, can you tell us a little bit about um, uh, the, the, this peculiar form of, of slavery? Yes, you're, you're right. 
uh, we're talking about two different legal traditions. Uh, the common law tradition, um, which views slaves as chattel, their property. And the, on the other hand, the Spanish legal tradition that dates back to Las Siete Partidas in medieval Spain, which recognized slavery as an evil institution and recognize that slaves will naturally want to become free. And it offers certain protections to slaves that, uh, that are codified in, in Spanish law. So two very different things. As a result of that Spanish tradition, uh, slaves are given the opportunity to become free <clears throat> through the process that you mentioned, which is coartación. So let's say that, you know, this slave uh, wants to become free. The slave negotiates with the master to see how much, what the value of, of, of the slave is in, in terms of money. And then the slave comes up with a down payment for his own or her own freedom. And then you pay in installments. Now, that is easier said than done. Uh, Marvin Harris, a great anthropologist, uh, once uh, used the phrase, uh, yes, uh, Madrid or Spain could provide all the laws that it could, but in the lowlands, sugar was king. In other words, and this takes us back to the corrupting uh, effect of, of slavery. So yes, that was an institution, and um, it we don't have those parallels in the United States. Actually, there is a process of re-enslavement uh, that happens uh, particularly during the 1850s before the Civil War. Um, the, but still, if you became uh, a free person, and this is a, a term that I, I learned, you know, the, word, the Spanish word ahorrar, which means to save money, well, guess where that word comes from? To my surprise, I learned that uh, to become an ahorro, which is a free slave, you must ahorrar. It's just wow. a discovery that I made. Yeah. Um, so yes, there were differences. Now, when we look at slavery, and there's a huge body of literature comparing slavery in different parts of the Americas, going back to Tannenbaum's book, mm -hmm. Slave and Citizen, which if I recall correctly, came out first in 1946. And, and there are different ways of comparing the systems. And the evidence suggests, and this is actually his thesis, that um, slaves were considered citizens, and they use that word, not the free slaves, and, and sometimes the slaves themselves, um, but when we look at the material conditions, again, the law can say you can do this and you need to be protected from your master. And there are these institutions that protect you. But when, it, when we look at the material circumstances of slaves, um, the, the general, uh, the, the, the dominant conclusion is that materially speaking, slaves in North America were better off. I hesitate to use the word better off, yeah. even. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a great, great point to make. Um, what, there's so much to talk about. And uh, what, what, are the, what, what I want to do is I want to just kind of talk a little bit more about kind of creolization and definitely sugar, because we have to. It's on the cover of your book <laughs> for, for a good reason. Um, but I want to open it up to questions uh, as well. So. Um, what uh, I, there's so many great stories in, in your book. I love the story of the fort commander and the street vendor. Um, and I think that that speaks to, I think you use the, the Ayako uh, metaphor yeah. to describe, but I uh, didn't know. So platanitos come from Africa, right? So that is the African, that's an African culinary legacy. Can you tell and us a little from bit? The that's canary a great story. Islands. Oh, and from the Canary. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. You know, I, I forget his name. Um, um, the Arana. That yeah. was the last name, the Arana. 
So the Arana is one of those characters that I fished out of the documents. And I said to myself, I need to interject this character. Um, the Arana comes to Havana to command the biggest and most important fort, which has just been built. He shows up with his wife, uh, but also with his mother-in-law, who appears to be a very domineering uh, person. And uh, there are many protests that the wife and the mother-in-law are, have become so powerful that they are dictating to the troops what to do. Now, this gentleman is a very complicated character, and uh, he was involved in illegal trade. He couldn't trade to begin with because of his position. Um, he also liked to dress as a woman. Uh, he yeah, shows that was, up. That to, was fascinating. That, yes. That, <laughs> he shows up to the meat market in a negligee and I wish I could come up with these things but they're in the records when he was being um, residenciado when he was being judged as far as far as his um, what he did well while he held that position these accusations come out of there and then um, there's an accusation that he was um, he would have gatherings at home and he would dress like a woman and there was one sketch where he was playing the role of a prostitute now this is the the the, the biggest military position on the island and then there's another one which i use as a window because one day he goes out to the streets apparently he liked doing that and he comes across a vendor uh an uh uh, a black woman who's selling uh, frituras. She has a little stand. And by the way, this is one of those practices that come from Africa. And uh, he stops and he asks for um, fried banana. <clears throat> and she, he, she fries the banana for him. And the accusation says that, you know, he really uh, lowered the status of his position because he even ate it right there on the street, eating the banana, the fried banana, and that it was so hot that he burned his tongue. Um, what I use this uh, story for, uh, metaphorically, is what we call the aplatanamiento. Uh, I don't think there's a good English translation for that. There's, there's a funny one that I use, which is, I mean, maybe Rich, you can come up with another, which is banana-like, <laughs> to turn banana-like. Uh, which means not that you're going to turn into a banana, but it means that you're going to embrace the culture of the islands and the tropics, aplatanado. So Spaniards who spent too much time in Cuba tended to become aplatanados, and uh, the arana was was an interesting case, Psychi yeah. psychiatric psychiatric case. <laughs> and it, it it speaks to the the creolization of, of the culture. Um, and you do a great job of leading into kind of the history of the Virgen de la Caridad, which I, I did not know. She comes from Spain originally. I mean, I'm not, I don't know a whole lot about um, religious history, but Virgen de la Caridad is from Iescas, I think you, in yes. Spain. And the way she becomes creolized into the Virgen de la Caridad del Cobre is also um, uh, a great story that uh, is, is in your book. Um, but I, I wanna just talk a little bit about piracy because I think it's fa fascinating and then we can get to, to sugar. Um, so how, how does that uh, shape Cuba? Because now we're getting into the 1600s, which is kind of like the heyday of of mm -hmm. this whole Pirates of the Caribbean um, period, and and what what how was that important to, to to Cuba's history? Well, Havana becomes because it, it is such an important port. Uh, it has to be protected, and uh, it is fortified, and also, as I mentioned earlier, the fleets with treasures of silver. Uh, on the way to back to Europe, and these were convoys of many, many vessels, 
uh, they had to stop in Havana. So that turned Havana into a, you know, a, a major protocol. And all these soldiers, uh, sailors, would spend sometimes months in Havana. So Havana develops a, a flavor as a port city with all of the good and the bad that comes with that. And it is also a, a military bastion. That's why we see these wonderful um, fortifications that are, are still standing in Havana. Havana was also a, uh, a, a walled city, although they're just two small parts of that wall that are still standing as, as relics. Uh, and that had an, an impact, uh, the militarization of Cuba on Cuban culture. Um, I, in my book on the Cuban revolution, I use the term an island on horseback, uh, which I borrow from a Cuban poet. Um, and Cuba is indeed an island on, on horseback. Uh, the military, the role of the military leaders, um, the captain generals who were so powerful. And then of course, uh, since then, Cuba has had a, a history of, of dictatorship. Where does that come from? Uh, why doesn't Puerto Rico have the same tradition? Well, I, I, and one of the reasons why I wrote this book, frankly, is to shed light on, on the present and not just on that early colonial era, but the kind of culture that emerged, a veneration of the man on horseback being one of those characteristics. Right. Um, yeah, I, um, I, I know that in the 1700s, certainly, in Sherry Johnson's book talks about that, the social transformation of Cuba. Um, yes, that's, that's a good point because later on, um, particularly after the British attack on Havana in 1762, uh, where the Cuban elite... Yeah. Yes, yes. And it became important to have, on the one hand, military titles. So the crown, in order to keep Cuban Creoles uh, faithful, um, they, they grant them uh, titles of nobility. <laughs> um, they grant them uh, military titles. And that adds to that uh, value of the military leader uh, and certainly something that added to that was the fact that Cuba was fighting for its independence for roughly three decades in the 19th century. Yeah, and also there are uh, pe free people of color who are in, in regiments as well. Yes. It's a whole nother phenomenon that. Um... Yes, that's very interesting because there's also a tradition of uh, those who are of mixed racial ancestry, mulatos, for example, to use the military as a source of mobility. And if you look at the you know, military parades in Cuba, for example, you still notice that it is overwhelmingly composed of uh, dark skinned Cubans, black or mulatto. That's a good point. Um... Can you tell us a little bit about the sugar industry in Cuba and how that uh, takes off and um, looking at sugar as a revolution versus a kind of as a revolution light? Um, sugar and a revolution where you have new diseases that are introduced, it's a revolution in the sense that it alters things politically, demographically, the islands, not Cuba, but the Caribbean islands be, tend to become more black as opposed to white. How does this whole notion of sugar, the sugar revolution play out in Cuba, keeping in mind that we don't really see it reach its peak until the 19th century. So how is, how is it playing out in the late 16th and 17th centuries in Cuba? What shape does it take? Yes. Um, one of the things that you may have noticed in the book <clears throat> is that I refrain from using jargon. <clears throat> I also refrain from the unnecessary quoting of the flavor of the month theoretician, uh, which is something that is very prevalent, unfortunately, in history. Uh, we spend more time talking about theoreticians from India or 
or you know Europe, uh, whose contributions I believe have very little to add to the study of Cuban history, yet it is sort of fashionable to quote these characters. I, I stay away from that. Um, but I do make use of some of the best scholarship on the Caribbean. For example, Sidney Mintz, I mentioned earlier, V.S. Napel, who is a novelist, but has a good understanding of the Caribbean. And one of them is, of course, Fernando Ortiz. Yes. Fernando Ortiz um, was called, actually, the third discoverer of Cuba. He was an anthropologist. I think he was born in the Canary Islands, Rich. Is that, mm -hmm. is that the Might case? Might be. That may be. Yeah. yeah. Well, in, in any event, Columbus being the first, and then Alexander von Humboldt being the second discoverer because he, he visited Cuba and he said, why is this island so underdeveloped with all the riches? And he wrote, you know, uh, he prescribed things that Cubans could do. And then Ortiz as this third discoverer, he's best known for his contributions on Afro-Cuban history and culture. And if, if people who are in the audience haven't read his classic work, Cuban Counterpoint, El Contrapunteo Cubano, they should. Uh, it's a dated book in some regards, published originally in 1940, but still very stimulating. And one of the things that he says, well, he does several things. <clears throat> we can also talk about the Ajiaco in a couple of minutes. But he presents a history of Cuba with two characters. And the two main characters is Don Tabaco and Doña Azúcar. And he counterpoints the two. And he sort of idealizes the world of tobacco. Very little slavery. We know that there were slaves in tobacco. Uh, however, um, democracy, small land uh, holdings, as opposed to all of the evils that sugar brings. And sugar is awful, um, according to him. Uh, sugar brings slavery. Uh, sugar requires a large investments in technology, which means that very few of the entrepreneurs could do that. And that's why they, um, only the wealthy ones could. Uh, it, sugar brings the concentration of land, lots of land in, in one hand. Another thing that I, I talk about in this book is that uh, sugar historically has been dependent on the state because sugar is a vulnerable crop. And in Cuban history, it depended on the outside market. So how much is being paid for Cuban sugar? So we see that early on, there, there's, I think it's in this last chapter on, on slavery, the planters demand and the planters get loans from the crown so that they can invest in sugar production. Uh, I also go into the um, environmental consequences of sugar, some of the writings of the time, how the Almendares River and other rivers were polluted, how it has a um, negative effect on the soils, how, because sugar became so important, how it pushes out almost every other economic activity. And then what are you going to do? What are you going to eat? Not sugar, of course. So I talk about the term, the sugar revolution, which is widely used, particularly in the, the study of the British islands and the French islands, and this started in the 1600s when the entrance of sugar and slavery completely transformed societies like Barbados. Now, what we have in Cuba is not as fully developed. I talk about, rather than a sugar revolution, I talk about a sugar rebellion, which is a way of saying, well, you know, it's similar, but a much uh, smaller scale. And certainly, when we talk about sugar in Cuba during the late 1500s and during the 1600s, we are looking at very localized places. In other words, most of the island was uh, an economic frontier. You mentioned the, the 
the cattle industry, tobacco, which was also tied to contraband. Um, so the sugar industry that begins to explode in Cuba is not an all-consuming endeavor. It does become that beginning in the late 1700s and it peaks around the 1850s. Yeah, certainly after Saint-Domingue, after the Haitian Revolution is really when Cuba becomes mm -hmm. uh, the world's uh, leading sugar producer. Um, so thank you so much, uh, Professor Martinez, for, for sharing all of this great insight. I, I want to open it up to any questions that anyone might have on, on anything. Brian, can you see if uh, anybody can't see on my... We do have some on Facebook, but I have, um, I have a few quick questions for myself. So um, my family, uh, I appreciate this book so much because my family didn't go to, move to Havana until the 1920s. So if you're looking for any kind of historical uh, story to put with those ancestors outside of Havana, like you said in your book, there's two. it's two different worlds there. It's You can have Havana, mm -hmm. And someone who lives in the middle of the island or even in Santiago de Cuba is going to have a different, a different kind of life. So um, I really appreciate reading that part of the book. Um, I'm glad my ancestor doesn't have 200 children in his family tree because that would, that sounds like an overwhelming, um, I, I know you said he was mean, but how can you have that many girlfriends and you're, you're mean? He must have been super handsome. <laughs> <laughs> well. Of, of course, the, the power uh, instances of, of rape, uh, oh. he was very powerful and he owned these women and, and the men in, the, in his town. He actually built a town uh, which had different names. One was Los Cayos and I forget the other names. He, so, you know, if, if we look carefully, you're going to be hard pressed to find a Cuban who has not, who doesn't have that ancestry. And, and you're right. Uh, one of the things that has dominated the study of Cuban history is Havana. Havana is so dominant in the historiography. And one of the things that I wanted to do is to make a concerted effort in including Santiago, in, because many different things were happening there. You see, there was a rigid social structure in Havana, but in Santiago, things were more relaxed. And that's why you have also a larger percentage of uh, race mixture in the eastern part of Cuba. So I made an effort to include these other places, um, not just Havana. Um, I also enjoyed your uh, book on Protestantism, Protestant, you know, the Protestant influence in Cuba. I know you wrote that back in the early 2000s, um, but I did find an ancestor in there. So really. Um, I just want you to, uh, uh, Nicholas Bello, I just want you to know a distant ancestor that we appreciate, you know, genealogists, even though we're not, you know, at the university, we were, we're you know, we enjoy reading these things. We, 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 you know, we absorb it as quickly as possible. And I enjoyed, um, I also enjoyed that book as well. So um, I also want to let everybody know that the book, you can get a 30% off uh, of Professor Martinez's book. Uh, with code save30. Um, the, we actually posted the, the PDF of the, of the book on our Facebook page, uh, but you could order it at upress.ufl.edu. If you do it through there, you can save 30% off with code save30. Perfect. Um, Brian, thanks for your kind words about the book on Protestants. Um, you told me that it cost about $300 uh, in Amazon. Uh, you don't have to spend that much money. Just give me your address and I'll send you a complimentary copy. It's $786. I've been watching it just go up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, that, that's, that's also a compliment, right? That it's a, it's a well sought after book. So um, I have a couple questions from Facebook. Um, do you think this? Uh, do you think uh, Columbus was Jewish or uh, had a Jewish background? I don't know. I've never heard of that before. I know he was Italian, but there's a lot of debate over whether he was 
even Italian or whether he was uh, Catalan or whether he was Jew, right? It's just, I don't think we'll ever know. Yes, what I can tell you is that there's very little, that he was profoundly Catholic. Uh, so, and, and there were many Jews and, and, and Muslims who converted and then they ended up uh, assuming names like Santos and Rosario just to show how converted they, they were. But I, I have, I've studied Columbus for decades and I know people who have, and I have heard that, but there's nothing that I've seen in the record that sustains that, that story. Yeah. Uh, have you ever heard of the, the apellido Ruiz de Zarate in the early colonial Ruiz de Zarate? That was just a question that had come up in the Facebook live chat. Yes, the name rings a bell from that period, but I forget in what context. Um, then someone had mentioned a book called The War in Cuba or The Great Struggle for Freedom by Gonzalo de Quesada that was written in the late 1800s. Um, yes. Are you aware of that book or have any comments about that book? Yes, I, I use that book because before I... His family tree because that would... Whoops. Yeah. I remember that book. He was a Cuban patriot. And, you know, I think I may have mentioned Choteo either in this conference or or when we were talking earlier. Uh, I mean, he came up with, <laughs> with a phrase that I quoted in some of my books. He was, of course, very anti-Spanish. And uh, I happen to have two grandparents who were from Spain. So this is not against Spain, but or Spaniards, many of whom I have many friends there. But he said, the only machine that the Spaniards have brought to Cuba is the garrote, which of course was an extrangulation device. Not quite accurate, but it shows uh, the way he felt about Spain. Again, nothing against Spaniards. <laughs> we do have a question on, uh, I mean, just on anything you might know about Pinar del Rio and how that kind of takes shape. Um, it's that's like the other end of the island that we don't talk about much. <laughs> Do you know anything about that or? Uh, I I know that. Oh yeah, Pinar del Rio. That's yeah. I also have ancestry. Well, you're from there. From, yeah, 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 yeah. It, it's a complicated story, but uh, yeah. uh, in Pinar del Rio, it was sort of the poorest area, and even into the 1950s, it was one of the poorer areas. Uh, as far as provinces go, um, it depended largely on tobacco and other activities. Um, slavery was not that strong of an institution there, uh, but you're right. Um, there's not much written about them. Some colleagues have written on tobacco recently and have studied that, that region. Um, I don't think it figures too much in my book because the colonization of that part of the island, if I recall correctly, came later, uh, 1700s. <clears throat> uh, do we have any any other questions? I see There's questions in our chat here in Zoom. Yeah, okay. Let me start with um, Allison. Uh, did the French of Saint Dominique move to Cuba just because it was close by after the slave rose against the French? And she has her Cornier left for Trinidad de Cuba as a result of the uprising. Yes, that's a good point. Uh, this is beyond the period of my book, but in essence, um, it was a, a war where all whites were either killed or had to flee. And they went to different places. They went, of course, to New Orleans, some of them. Others went to Puerto Rico. Uh, the island of Vieques, for example, there's some French last names there. Um, they also went to Cuba, particularly Oriente, and that's where coffee gets a boom, precisely because of planters who were forced to flee and resettled in Cuba. Um, yes, um, they did come in large numbers. Um, Samuel, would you like to Ask your question. ¿Y podemos hablar en español o, o en inglés? Sí, 
Samuel, ¿estás ahí? Sí, estoy acá. Sí. Hola. Bien. Bueno, la pregunta era básicamente porque me llamó la atención que mencionaron que Abasco por Cayo, que lo tenemos en los árboles genealógicos, pero me sorprendió la cifra, 200 hijos. Y bueno, parte de mi trabajo de tesis, yo estoy mirando una base de datos que es una recopilación de muchos árboles genealógicos de Jenny y MyHeritage. Y salió un resultado sorprendente, un puntito al final que no esperábamos, que es una persona con 200 hijos. Y pensamos que era un error, no sabemos qué ha pasado. Y bueno, ver esto de Vasco Bocayo me sorprende. Pudiera ser que alguien lo subió a MyHeritage o a Jenny. Eh, igual, la pregunta iría por si hay alguna referencia, si hay alguna fuente en las que se hayan citado, porque bueno, se lo tendría que comentar a mi tutor ahora el martes y sería bueno llevarle algo. Sí, eh, ahora mismo no recuerdo sin examinar las notas del libro dónde encontré eso. Lo importante es esto, no es, si, si, fue, si hubiera tenido 100 hijos en un país donde hubiera 800 mil personas, pues eso no hubiera tenido tanta trascendencia, pero estamos hablando de los principios donde había unos pocos miles de personas y hablar de 200 hijos, pues ya eso uh, ya es sustancial. Me interesa mucho el punto, uh, Sebastián, que presenta, de, en la base de datos que surge una persona con ese número de hijos. Me encantaría eh, saber más de eso. Eh, si quieres, nos podemos comunicar eh, uh -huh. en, en adelante. Mu mucho éxito en, en tu proyecto. Gracias. There was another question, I think, in the chat. Uh, you can unmute yourself, Al. Okay, Allison, we had her question. Leia, did you have a question or? Denise, anyone no, else? Uh, no, I don't have a question. I was just kind of commenting on her question. Thank you. Oh. She just said island migration was common and she's still trying to piece together her French connection. So, um, Professor, yeah, I, I think if there's we're still a lot of French. Uh, there's still a lot of French last names in the eastern part of the island. Yes. Yeah, I have a, I have some in, um, they're from San Nicolás de Bari. So that's that's kind of where they're, I'm trying to get them out of there, but. Oh, French last names from San, San Nicolás de Bari? San Nicolás de Bari. You know, uh, Professor, I wanted to ask you a, a little, I mean, you, you allude a little bit in your book to it, but um, as the hinterland of Havana, which is all becomes all these towns like San Jose de las Lajas, mm -hmm. eh, Guinness, you know, um, San Nicolas de Bari, Madru, all these like towns. What was their purpose early on? We know Havana kind of assumes this important as, as a service entrepot. Was this where these these towns like where where crops were grown and food was grown? Yes, they were associated with um, the kinds of products that we talked about, tobacco, and that's where the Canary Islanders play an important role, uh, but also um, cattle ranching. And one of the main products was, which the Canarians were largely involved in was uh, harvesting, I think the word is maloja, that is feed for, for, for cattle. Sugar didn't make it to those regions until actually uh, the 20th century. Sugar was concentrated in Havana, Matanzas. Now, a couple of things about the last names. And those of you who are studying uh, genealogy in Cuba know the incredible number of last names that are different that are in Cuba. Uh, you don't find that in other places in the Americas. Uh, certainly not in Puerto Rico, which is another island that I study, you know, the Hernandezes and the Riveras. But when, when it comes to Cuba, you find all of these last names, Italian, French, of course, um, Basque. It's somebody should study that, you know, what that means in terms of the uh, diversity of Cuba, the fact that there's so many different last names. Yeah, that's that. That's a great, a great point. Uh, Dennis, my last name is not. You wouldn't think it's uh, Cuban, but but 
It is actually Canarian, but uh, yeah. That, that's well, I, I have two Patrician last names. <laughs> Martinez yes, you and do. Fernandez. <laughs> you're, you're, you're la, la vieja guardia. I guess, yes. <clears throat> uh, do we of have course, they're, they're not Patrician at all. <laughs> Rich and Dennis, you guys are um, are planning to go to Cuba this time around, or how is the project with the? Um... Uh, I'm I'm waiting personally. I, I'm I'm waiting for COVID restrictions to be lifted. Okay. So right now you still have to isolate for five days uh, at your at your you know, and you have to pay for that. So I'm not willing to to waste that time. You know, okay. five, five days is a long time. Once that it's relaxed, maybe if it's like a day or two, you have to be quarantined. I, I would be willing to go. Yeah, I'll be on the first plane, but right now it's, yeah. 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 I, I'm thinking January. Okay. You know, January is a good kind of target date. Perfect. But yeah. And we, yeah, we, we had have a lot of projects that were, that were left on media there which is really unfortunate because we had a lot of parishes that were really excited about us going in there and digitizing and unfortunately um we yeah. couldn't we have one boot on the ground we had one boot on the ground there which was great um but it's it's, it's one person so we we really have to get back Perfect. brown yo did you have a question you can unmute yourself yeah there's both um Jan I'm sorry, November 15, they're supposed to be opening up again. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Well, that's good to know. No restrictions. All you got to have is, you know, a test from here saying that, uh, you know, you're you're not positive. And you don't have to quarantine? No. Oh, that's great. Yeah, they're getting ready for the hotels to reopen and everything. That's good news. I'm, I'm sure the they must be doing, you know, they, they depend on tourist economy. So, I mean, they must just be. Well, that and supposedly by that time, they'll be at almost at 100% with the vaccination. Okay. Um, well, let's hope. Yeah. That's, that's good news. Yeah. yeah. Um, Denise had a question about Colonial Trinidad. Um, she's having a hard time accessing church records there because the books are in bad condition. Um, yeah. And she's learning about her Sarosa ancestors. So, um, did you come across any uh, uh, anything in your research, Professor, about uh, Trinidad? No, but I believe that the the origins of Trinidad are uh, Vasco Porcayo's village, if I recall correctly. Wow, yeah. that's so interesting. And the detail I read in, in your book on it, on Trinidad was pretty depopulated in the late 1500s. There were no white residents, right? So, it, it, because everybody had left, the Spanish actually left, you know, to, to yeah. go to places like Mexico, Peru, and Trinidad didn't have a single white inhabitant. Yeah, it was hard to keep white colonists on the island because they were hearing all these wonderful stories about the wealth and the richness of Mexico and Peru, uh, and actually the government uh, promoted marriage because they believe that if you were married, you were less likely to leave Cuba and go to another place. And there were some severe punishments. Uh, there's a word uh, that I came across is desjarretar. And that of course connects with the word jarrete, which, uh, which is part of the leg and one of the penalties was to desjarretar individuals who were caught escaping. And it, it was also why uh, so many Canarian uh, migrants came is because they would usually travel as fan, you know, with their whole family. So I think that was also encouraged by, yes. by the crown, which is why I think a lot of us have those Canarian women that we can trace in the, on, on our in our paper trails, they, mm -hmm. they come with their husband and they come. Yes. And I think Manuel Hernandez, I don't know if he's still on, but his his work also um, touches on that and I think provides actual. I may have the wrong 
one in mind, but one of them provides actual ship logs that list the families that came over from Tenerife uh, in the in the late 1600s. Um, I have a question, if you don't. Hi, hi, Denise. Um, a question, and and thank you um, for for this. Was so very interesting, very informative. I really, you know, really appreciate all the hard work that everybody goes into keeping this going. Um, it's great. And I want just uh, just a question to go back to uh, Um if, if you're saying like in the late 1500s, it was really depopulated. Um, so let me think. And I go back as far as maybe the, the mid 1700s with my Sarosa line. So somewhere in between, up like, you know, when the Vascos started going there, was it would have been in the 1500s, or maybe they would have started going to Geneva later on, like closer to the maybe 1700s. Probably in the 1600s, wouldn't you say, Professor? It starts to populate again. Yes. Yeah. Once Havana, once once Cuba, you know you know, becomes, you know, has that importance of being this kind of midway point between Europe and the Americas and all the ships are going through there. And like Professor said, it becomes very cosmopolitan. I think you see more Spanish migration. Thank you. Uh, do we have any other questions, Brian? That, that um, I see one it? about a Taino village in Oriente um, that claims they still have original Taino population, um, but we the, they couldn't remember the name of the of the. Is it Baracoa? I think it might be Baracoa, because I think Baracoa still claims to have. Uh, yeah. Taino, there's some Taino I, tourism there or something. Yeah. Yes, um, actually, I talk about one of those villages in towards the end of the chapter on the Tainos, and it may be Yateras, Y A T E R A S. They have a museum there, and um, they're very proud of that heritage. So, and, and, and Yateras was one of those uh, indigenous. Um, hmm communities the uh, the reducciones yes yeah. Yeah. okay we have a question from Deborah on were there any jewish uh from santiago de cuba with the surname cuba um mm -hmm. or jewish migration in general say to santiago do, I, I unfortunately I don't know much about Jewish, you know, Jewish presence. I know that it was uh, migration from Spain to to the colonies was very heavily regulated by the crown um, and controlled by the House of Trade, which I think one of one of the reasons for that uh, House of Trade was to prevent any Jews and Muslims for, for you know from coming to to the New World. Um, but I know a lot of us have Jewish ancestry, so I don't know. I'm sure there were ways or ways ways around that. Yes, mm -hmm. and uh, they were called crypto Jews. Uh, many of them ended up in Mexico, and it's fascinating to see how they uh, try to retain some of their practices and rituals, and how difficult it was because uh, the Inquisition that we talked about earlier uh, targeted them. Uh, very much. And what I have found is that there was a, you know, th they couldn't do much about the Iberian Peninsula because Jews and uh, Muslims had been there for centuries, but they wanted to make sure that that didn't happen in the New World. Um, it's interesting how the crown wants to do things in the Americas that it is no not able to do in the peninsula. And that's why they want to create something from scratch. And they want to make sure that it is clean uh, without religious impurities, as they, uh, which is the term that, that they used. And of course, we know about the large migration of Jews to Cuba in the 20th century, uh, most of whom, as, as you may know, left Cuba after um, Fidel Castro took over. Mm 
Oh, so the, the surname is actually Cohen. Um, are, are, yeah, so are you familiar with any Cohen names? I'm, I'm, I'm not in, in, some, in Santiago. Um, Professor, can you, um, do you have, are you working on any projects right now that you can share with us? Or do you have any dream projects that you would like to do in the future? Well, thanks for asking. Um, I'm 61 years old and a couple of years ago I recited, I decided to reinvent myself, which sounds like something Madonna would do. And, and that has to do with uh, exploring other genres. I have become a nationally syndicated columnist and I write about contemporary issues in the United States and all over the world but always with a historical connection, trying to explain what we're seeing uh, and living through with uh, access to, to history. So I have finished a manuscript uh, with the title, All History is Contemporary History, which is a collection of, uh, of essays and opinion pieces that I've published over the last two years. Uh, I don't have a publisher yet, so if you have any ideas, let me know. I did notice you wrote a lot about the census recently. And, you know, so my father's Cuban. And I always have this problem when I fill out the census or anything that's trying to capture race in America, where it says white, not Hispanic. Hispanic, you know, none of the categories fit for a lot of us. And it's just frustrating to live in the United States and have a little, you know, mini identity crisis, because you don't know how to describe yourself. You don't fit into any of these governmental categories. Ryan, I feel the same exact way. <laughs> yes. Exact way. One, one interesting thing, and uh, a couple of years ago, uh, a journalist from Spain uh, called me, he wanted to know my, my views on the subject that it's interesting because uh, Hispanic includes uh, people whose ancestry is from Spain uh, or L Latin America. That's what the category calls for. But it means that if you're Spanish, you don't belong to the white category. And the person that called me was sort of upset about that representation, uh, which is interesting. So you could be from Egypt and you're white, according to the census. But if you're Spanish, you, you have to be Hispanic. And of course, there, there are races under that. And, and one of the ones that you can choose, of course, is Cuban. Not all countries are mentioned. They do give a list of uh, the top, as far as numbers go, uh, countries, Mexico, of course, Cuba, Puerto Rico, El Salvador. Mm. Um, I'm glad you put you mentioned food in your book because that's always tied to a story or to a to your family or to our, our everyday life. And I enjoyed knowing that you went to like Peru, which is a, one of my favorite types of food. Um, yes. Cuban food is good, Puerto Rican. So I'm glad you put the ajiaco in there because I've had ajiaco in Colombia and I, I didn't know how much the Americas have in common that we don't, you know, Cubans think it's Cuban. Yes. No, they have it in different countries. Now, you're opening a door for me to tell a story, which is a real story. Uh, I have a, a colleague who teaches in Cuba, a dear friend. I think he's retired now. And he was telling me the story that he visited one of the centrales in Cuba. Uh, it used to be called Hershey. I f it has a different name now, but it's in the northern coast. And he was invited to talk to the workers about slavery, which he had studied, and and he used uh, Manuel Moreno Frajinal's book, which has lots of uh, statistics on the diet of the slaves. And so he was making his presentation. The, the room was full of uh, cane cutters and other uh, workers of the cane. And he said, well, during slavery, the average slave ate, uh, I don't know how many 
pounds of, of, of codfish and how many pounds of rice. And he went on and on. And he opened it up for the Cuban Choteo because the people in the audience <laughs> started saying, que vuelvan los españoles, <laughs> we want slavery back. Uh, no comment. <laughs> it's a true story, though. Um, any other questions? Again, uh, you can get a 30% discount on the book. Um, and we have that information on our Facebook page. Um, Brian, are there any other questions? No, I don't see any other questions on Facebook. Um, I just want to thank you uh, so much, Rich and uh, Prof Dr. Martinez, for uh, giving us your time, for writing this book, and for you know writing something that we're all interested in that it's hard it's all in pieces out there nothing to kind of to sit down and and visualize what it was like in cuba you know 300 years ago 400 years ago as opposed to just you know 60 years ago so uh we thoroughly appreciate um thor thoroughly appreciate the book thank you thank you for the conference as well and the great presentation thank you very much i'm, I'm glad the you find the book useful uh, I enjoyed writing it very much and discovering all these strange characters that came out of the documents. Yeah, and oh, I wanted to ask, can you tell us just a little bit about your sources? I know you mentioned the protocolos notariales, and I know that mm -hmm. there are some, I actually have two of them. I think it's a set of three books that you can get. They're probably mm -hmm. like $700 a piece, <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> Did, is that what you you use the protocolos notariales as for some of your as some of your sources? Well, that's a very good question. Uh, historians, uh, what something that separates us from other social sciences is that we we have to look at the documents, primary documents. That's an important component. Now, I was fortunate that there is so much in terms of documents that are published. Uh, About it, right? I think. Yeah, did you go use Yeah, yeah. Okay. I used that a little bit, um, but so many of them have been published as books. And one of them, which, you know, I love reading because you, you, you find these wonderful stories, is a book from the late 1700s by a physician who visited plantations in the area of Matanzas. And it's a wonderful source that talks about uh, real cases of slave diseases, and he even goes into the subject of, uh, he was a, a pioneer, I think, uh, mental illness among the slaves. So it is in those sources that, that you really get the grit and you get the real people and you're able to humanize the stories that you talk about. Thank you. Um... Well, Brian, I think uh, I think we're we're good. Again, thank you so much, um, Dr. Martinez. Um, I recommend everybody read his book. Um, I think it flows easily, and I'm very grateful for that. Um, you know, you don't like like you said, you don't want to load it with a lot of jargon, um, mm -hmm. and so it makes it not only um, it makes it an enjoyable read, you know? Thank um, you. Well, I guess we will um, wrap it up and then next month we'll, we'll do, we'll have another um, session. We'll, we'll um, talk about another aspect of Cuban history and, and, and genealogy. Um, I also posted um, Dr. Martinez's uh, creators link if you want to read what he's written recently i put that on the facebook page and we'll Thank post you. that on facebook again um if you if you'd like to keep track of uh uh dr dr martin oh, we should writes. post something on the protestant on the book on protestants as well yeah i'm saving up for that one that 786 you know oh, yeah that's right <laughs> no discount available for that one just yet but <laughs> Even 30% off is not going to help me with that. No, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I'll be putting a copy of that book in the mail for you. Thank you so much. I'll, I'll send you, I'll send you an email. So.
that that's also a very interesting book. You know, we know the Catholic Church, um, you know, is involved with, you know, we know about the, the concept of cemeteries in Cuba, but we, mm -hmm. we don't know, like, kind of before, like, 1860, we don't really know where our ancestors went. So that book was super helpful, not just from, like, Protestant, Catholic, but, like, what, you know, what laws affected the change in Cuba, you know, without giving up too much of the book, but what, what, where, where, where did our ancestors go in 1700s when they passed away on a, on a, on an island, you know? Yeah. Um, so that was very interesting. And it's, it's hard to, it's hard to Google information about Cuba. It's just not, it's just not an easy place to research, even though it's so close. It, sometimes it might as well be on another planet because, you know, it's a, there's a, there's a lot of history there. So there is a, a, another question I wanted to get oh. to uh, for Professor Martinez asking if you know Professor Angel Perez y Herrero. He teaches history at the University of Havana. No, I'm afraid I don't know him. Yeah. I, I haven't been back to Cuba in, in quite some time. I yeah. used to go every year, but not anymore. Okay, well, I uh, want to thank everybody for joining us today. And uh, a lot of people asked that this would be recorded. So fortunately, we did record it. So we're going to uh, not only have it on our Facebook page for those who, who couldn't join us, uh, but we're also going to kind of package it into a podcast format. Um, so, well, thank you so much. We look forward to to uh, reading, uh, I look forward actually to reading that product, the book on Protestantism uh, as well. Uh, so Brian, you'll have to lend that to me <laughs> when you get it. <laughs> Two copies, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Professor, so much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you everyone for attending. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much. Thank you, have a great day, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. You too. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Thank, Thank you, you too. Yeah. Gracias, Samuel. Thank you so much. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you. So we'll send you we'll send you some links to the when we post this, Dr. Martinez, just so you know what where where it went. So